I'd like to share an anecdote with you. It goes back to my childhood. It's about a miserable failure. And for those of you who start to think, oh, oh, <laughs> University of Vienna professor, but we weren't expecting the late Sigmund Freud, let me appease you or disappoint you. It's not going to be anything like that, right? That anecdote merely encapsulates one of the major reasons why some organizations tend to do well when they try to aim high as a collective, as opposed to some organizations that don't get it done. So let me take you back to the 1980s, when I grew up as a kid in the 1980s in what used to be Western Germany. Sizable soft drink corporations had a campaign going on, okay? And that campaign was one by which they were stamping little pictures underneath the lids of their soft drink bottles, okay? And you would have to fill them out, okay? Then you would get the picture and you would stick it on a poster. And of course, the whole purpose of this exercise was to get the com collection complete, right? So what we were doing, three friends of mine at the time and I, we said, okay, fine, let's run a little business. And uh, let's try to get into every soft drink shop that we can get into, fiddle out the pictures, and then we sell them to other collectors, right? That was the whole idea. Loads of things went wrong. Some of them are so embarrassing, I don't want to share them. But the one thing that I can share with you is we never sold a single picture, okay? Not a single one. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, you know, it took me years and sleepless nights to figure out that my school friends were simply not as enthusiastic about them as I was. They were not willing to put up a years of pocket money for a collection of fiddle pictures. Oh, well, you know, anyhow. So, uh, ironically, the only transaction of a fiddle picture I would have almost gotten involved with was three days ago, when I realized that my mother had them thrown all away, and I wanted to bring you one for this presentation. I was auctioning on eBay. It was about 100 euros, and I decided that's too much, okay? So I didn't bring you the original. I didn't, I didn't buy that one, okay? So that was... A... Anyhow, so that fiddle picture organization, of course, is just, uh, you know, uh, an example for trying to make you understand uh, why certain things go wrong. Of course, you know, at the surface, what we had gotten wrong was the pricing. And yes, we completely overpriced. Because there was no person in this organization thinking about what a customer wanted, what she was willing to pay, and so forth. Because us four, we were all bosses, okay? We were doing great things, okay? You know, discussion, the vision of the company, you know, the logo, uh, whatever else this was, job titles, and so forth. But it had nothing to do with selling fiddle pictures. And what we had created was an organization, actually, that was a boat full of captains with no sailors, okay? And that boat full of captains with no sailors is something that you encounter quite often when you see that organizations fail. And there are various reasons for this, and I'd like to go through some of those reasons with you. And of course, you have to distinguish between people who make these mistakes, you know, kids as we were at the time, okay, or laymen when they approach uh, running an organization and managing things, I believe face problem number one. And problem number one goes back to the fact that whenever we think of great human achievements, okay, we tend to think of human individual achievements. So let me just, you know, within this beautiful alpine setup here and, you know, true to the motto of the day, aiming high, recall that if you think of the first person who made it to the top of Mount Everest, of course, you're thinking of Sir Edmund Hillary, okay? Or equally famous in Austria, perhaps, and, you know, also mind-boggling, of course. If you think of a skydiver jumping from space, who do you think of? 2012, of course, you would think of Felix Baumgartner, right? Now, admittedly, these are individuals who were pushing the envelopes within their disciplines like no other, outstanding individuals. But I think we're not diminishing any of their accomplishments if we admit to the fact that that would not have been possible without the organizations that surrounded them. So in the case of Hillary, of course, you know, the most famous wingman, his right hand was Tenzing Norge, but let's not forget about dozens of other Sherpas helping him up the summit. And in the case of Baumgartner, okay, six seasoned professionals, one of them a record-breaking skydiver himself, and then myriads of other helpers. Now, one thing is pretty clear, right? If within these two organizations, everybody would have wanted to be the first man on Mount Everest or jump from space him or herself, that would not have worked because, again, you would have ended up with that boat full of captains and no sailors. So what do these organizations get right that other organizations get wrong, okay? So for that, we need to talk about organizations in a bit more detail because organizations, as a matter of fact, are not just some randomly assembled teams of people and so forth. They're very specific animals, okay? Yes, they are what we call multi-person systems, basically means several people working together, but, and that's important, these people do have individually different incentives, but jointly commit to a common goal. Okay. Now, I bet all of you are members of at least two organizations, the first one being your family, and the second one being your workplace. And uh, uh, why is your family uh, a family? Well, you know, very simple. Uh, there's mom, dad, and the kids, and they all think about different things at a given point in time, say, watch TV, eat pizza, and so forth, but then sometimes they do get their act together, and they go on a joint vacation, maybe even build a house together. So if I ask you, why are you a member of your family, many of you will say, because I didn't have a choice, okay? And that may be true, 
But let's face it, okay, there are also some advantages to this. Saturday night, okay, one person cooks, the other one washes the dishes. Okay, division of labor, maybe not the main reason why you stick to your family, but I argue that when you choose a workplace, division of labor is one of the major reasons as to why you select into a certain organization as opposed to another, right? And uh, that division of labor actually creates very interesting features within these organizations that I would like to spend a little bit of time on. And uh, the best way to highlight that is to run you through a fictitious example of you wanting to run a supermarket, okay? So what does it take for you to run a supermarket? Well, first thing you need is you need some money, okay? And then you need a place where you can set it up. Once you've got the place set up, negotiate your groceries, make sure the groceries come, put them on the shelves, okay? Then make sure that the customer comes through the door. Once the customer's through the door, inform her, make sure she pays, important, okay? And then deal with all her complaints. Imagine you want to run this thing together with your brother and your sister, okay? You're a great people guy, you're a great technical guy, and uh, your sister, by virtue of having managed the two of you for 20 years, is a great manager of the two of you, okay? So how are you gonna divide the work? Very simple, you're gonna deal with all the people issues, you know, the other person here deals with all the technical issues, and your sister becomes the manager of this little organization. Here, we have a triad formation. And in this picture, for the very first time, your sister is not playing boss because she wants to play boss, but because it is actually a useful reflection of the work that needs to be done, okay? Technical work, customer-related issues, and the coordination and incentivization of the two. How do you get from that little triad to an organogram of a multinational? Very simple, you just imagine that your supermarket takes off like a rocket, you turn it into a franchise, then what happens is, you become the people manager of loads of people managers, you become the technical manager of loads of technical managers, your sister becomes CEO, and boom, you know, you end up with this organogram. All right, what you have here now, and that's an interesting feature, and we need to spend some more time on this, you have a hierarchy. And a hierarchy is nothing but a layered relationship of authoritative positions within that organization. This hierarchy is gonna keep us busy, but before we go there, let me just recall, and that was what the supermarket example was also about, Every person within that organization plays a major role. This mid-level manager, just as much as this person here at the bottom, just as much as the CEO of that organization. So how come that if you know that, okay, if you know that you're putting together an organization for that purpose, there seems to be this strange gravitation towards the top, right? Like the Fiddle Picture Corporation. Problem number one was that we communicate these things as individual achievements and people try to look like great individuals. Problem number two sometimes is that managers actually get it wrong, okay? And how do they get it wrong? Well, they tend to believe in what we call steep incentives. And nowhere else is this more prominent than in a so-called upper-out model, where um, essentially individuals are being given the illusion that when they enter an organization, every position at the very bottom is just a race towards the top eventually, right? Because this is where you win the cup. And that upper-out model works in certain industries, in certain firms, but it hasn't worked a lot across loads of other organizations. And I guess one of the misconceptions why managers adhere to this still until this day is because they're so much afraid of this here. Complacency, right? That unless, you know, you actually give people these incentives, they all bum around. And only the boss is working. Well, admittedly, these organizations do exist, right? Particularly of a size, certain size and certain age, you know, these kinds of complacency effects can prevail, but that doesn't mean here that this is the solution. Of course it's not the solution, right? To make people temporarily appreciate what they do, but only, you know, under the promise that eventually they will be CEO one day. If you think of the Hillary organization, if you think of the Baumgartner organization, you're actually allowing the best Sherpa to be the best chairper if he wants to be the best chairper. And you're allowing the best, say, radio operator to be the best radio operator. You incentivize him to do so, you enable him to do so, you appreciate him for what he's doing, or her. So the recipe of creating an organization is, of course, to create an organization where you try to get the best person for each job, make sure she's happy, and then you structure your pyramid accordingly. And this is where things become really tricky, because of course there are very many smart managers out there who know exactly that, right? And they don't believe in the upper out model, so why does it still not work so easily? The reason is because these hierarchies, these very hierarchies that you put in place in order to keep the people where they should be, okay? Mid-level, lower level, higher level, and so forth, create a life of their own with toxic side effects that actually run exactly counter to what they should be doing, because they pull people to the top. 
Okay, so these administrative hierarchies, while necessary, distract people, make them aim high in undesired ways by what psychologists call exacerbating an effect of evaluation, apprehension, or lack of control. And the best way for me to explain this to you is by sharing some experiments with you, which we ran in Vienna, London, the United States. You can replicate them anywhere, and uh, they basically look as follows. So think of uh, the following setup. We're taking a bunch of experimental subjects. These are people who are being paid for taking part in an experiment, right? And what we're telling these people is, well, you know, look, you're going to be a mid-level manager of a firm, and depending on where we put you, you're going to have either one boss on top of you or maybe two. And of course, this is what we vary because this is part of the experiment, right? And here's your task. Your task is actually quite simple. From your fictitious subordinates or employees, you're going to get proposals for things that make the firm a better place. There are some bad ones. Please kill them. There are some good ones. Please pass them on to top management. And whenever you're uncertain, well, you can decide for yourself what you want to do with these. So here's the first scenario, treatment, as we would call it. In the first treatment, we're telling people you're going to get rewarded, financially rewarded, for all the great ideas that make it to top management. And, interestingly enough, we're telling them your bosses are friendly cooperators. Okay? So, what happens? It's pretty clear what happens to the bad ideas. They get weeded out. It's pretty clear what happens to the good proposals. They get passed on. But what happens to the ones that aren't certain? The ones that aren't certain, actually, also get passed on for the most part. And the more so, the more bosses are on top of that particular person. How can that happen? It's very simple, right, if you think about it. The reason is that if you know that you're going to be rewarded for all the great ideas that make it to top management, but if you prematurely kill an idea, your boss can never correct it. Whereas if you pass on an idea which was maybe bad, your boss can still correct for it. And since she's a friendly cooperator, that's exactly what she's going to do. So you're using your boss as a so-called rechecking device, okay? Now, now we modify that example just a little bit, this experiment, and we're telling people, look, you know, you're still getting rewarded for all the great ideas that make it to top management, but now, dare you if you make a mistake that your boss sees, you will be sanctioned. And sanctioning in a laboratory just means that we're going to subtract some of your profits, right? Sounds familiar? Sounds familiar to what you guys see, right? Make a mistake and not so good for you. So what happens now? What happens basically is that in the case of the uncertain ideas, and that are the only ones that we're really interested in, fewer ideas get passed on to top management, but interestingly so, ever fewer the more bosses you have on top of you. And why is that? Well, very simple. If you are afraid of negative feedback of your boss, you would imagine that your boss is negatively predispositioned towards the behavior of her boss. And so that effect ultimately, you know, sort of gets uh, exacerbated by the hierarchy, trickles down through the hierarchy, and this bowing, okay, towards the hierarchy becomes worse the more layers you have on top of you. And what has that hierarchy created now? That hierarchy has created a feeling of unease at the bottom, right? It's no fun to be at the bottom, because the further you're down, the more that effect of evaluation apprehension actually falls on your head. And so what it therefore also creates is a pull towards the top, because the only place where you don't have to be afraid of negative feedback by your boss is, by definition, at the top. And so the hierarchy is doing something which it shouldn't be doing. It was supposed to keep you in place, and instead it's pulling you up, which has got nothing to do with what the purpose was. It's got to do with the behavior of the people. Now we're changing that experiment just one more time, okay? And we're making it very realistic, and I hope that several of you can relate to this. What we're doing now is we're saying, you're still going to get rewarded for all the great ideas that make it to top management, but guess what? How your bosses make decisions is pretty unclear to you. Very erratic, okay? You know that feeling, right? You think you've done something really well, you pass it on, then you wonder, what, the hell, what did you do with it, okay? And it becomes ever more erratic the more people revisit that decision. That means the more layers of hierarchy you have on top of you. Now, what happens now? Of the uncertain ideas, hardly any get passed on anymore. And that is exactly what psychologists call lack of control. You're feeling at an, you have a feeling of unease at the bottom. Why? Because you're not in the driver's seat, but you know one thing. Whenever that proposal gets revisited by someone, you're going to get a call, you're going to get an email, there's going to be a memo, the work is going to end up on your desk, but you're not the one deciding whether it actually gets implemented or not. And so what do you do is you detach from the organization. And that effect gets ever worse the more layers of hierarchy you have on top of yourself. And finally, hierarchies have got one third nasty feature. And that is they signal 
what we call status superiority. And status superiority just means that if you look at this person here in this hierarchy, at the very bottom, she may be super happy with what she's doing. She may be paid just as much as she needs, okay? She may want to stay there if the world didn't have any other features, but she knows that if she was there, she would have more status, meaning that she would be seen as a person who can actually command over all sorts of outcomes, and that gives her all sorts of what we would call positive externalities in not only her professional life, but also in her private life. In old Prussia, a man wouldn't be able to marry the spouse of his choice unless he was an officer in the army. So you're trying to move up to this level for reasons that has got nothing to do, that have got nothing to do with optimal division of labor and integration of effort. So again, the hierarchy has created that pull towards the top. So what do great organizations get right when they're dividing labor and integrating effort? Because this is what organizations are all about. They're not demonizing hierarchies, okay, as some of the fashionable magazines and management so often would make you believe. These are very good instruments for structuring work, but they're making sure that they're suppressing the toxic side effects of these hierarchies, and that means they will make sure that they will be very careful in sanctioning motivated employees. They will be very, very much devoted to making people feel that they're involved in decisions, and what they will also do is they will try to make sure that specialists at the lower ranks receive the recognition they need and can attain status without moving to the top of the hierarchy, which would have got nothing to do with increasing corporate performance. So my message for you in a nutshell is, for an organization to reach high, of course everybody needs to reach high and aim high. The motivation is ultimately important, but that doesn't mean that all the people should do, should do that in the same way. They should do this in their very own ways, because we cannot all be bummers, that doesn't mean we can all be bosses. Thank you.